doing great. How are you doing? Not doing all right. Are you ready you. to answer some questions great about the myths and uh, to unveil some of the myths, whether it is true or not, and give us your opinion because there are a lot of questions coming in. So, ready to oh. jump right, right in? Oh. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Do Number it. one question. I need twenty. Do I? I always need twenty percent down to to get a mortgage and to buy a house. Okay, yeah, that's 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 like the uh, misconception. It's actually not a question that we get asked, but that's something that people think in the back of their heads. I need twenty percent, and I need to wait and save. Not at all. Um, there's two major groups of uh, mortgages: FHA, which is a government loan, you need three and a half percent. Conventional loans, you need five percent down. If you have served in the military, you're eligible for a VA loan. They're not 0%, which is the best loan out there. So not at all. You can have as low as 3.5% down and buy a so house. They're, they're lower down payments, so we can go as little as 0 for the VA loans, and we can start the conventional with 3% yes. down and FHA with 3.5% down. Conventional is usually 5 for certain uh, first time home buyers, there is a 3% down option that it's, it's you got to qualify for that. But uh, yes, it's theoretically, you're right. A three, there is a 3% down Excellent. conventional. And then the next question also has to do with the down payment. It is, it, the question mm -hmm. is, can I use gift funds if I don't have enough money? So yes, if you're buying a house to live in, not investment, uh, if you're buying the house to live in, which is what most our clients do, um, you can absolutely get a down payment from a, a, a relative. It could be a fiance, it could be a brother, mother, doesn't matter. Um, it cannot be a friend uh, most of the time. It again, cannot and, uh, <clears throat> be a friend? You can absolutely get, get a gift. Can not be a friend that that really is not considered a relationship anybody can be a friend the guidelines do not have friend uh, in it but anyone else even a niece and a nephew is acceptable as well uh, you can get a um you know a, a gift for your uh down payment and closing costs Excellent. absolutely and um another question is can you use the 401k money for the down payment you can. Um, the bank will want to know certain things about the 401k. Uh, so here's it, it goes back to the notion of when you want to buy a house, definitely talk to a loan officer. Definitely get pre-qualified ahead of time. Do not drop the bomb of, oh, I want to pull money out of the 401k. That, that, that's, that's risky. Uh, in some cases, uh, the lender is going to want to see your plan documents, your plan administrator, what kind of documents they have. In theory, it's possible, but you want to make sure uh, that um, uh, that with your specific 401k administrator, it's possible. Okay, another question is how many, it's not a myth, but uh, the question is like how many people can go on the loan at a time? Like can it only be the spouses or not really like you don't have to be blood related no uh so i'm not aware of a a, a limit uh on, on loans we've done is i think the max i've done is three uh but i know you could do like m more uh I, I don't know hopefully it's not 30 people buying a house but uh um uh, it, uh, the, the, it, it again it depends it's it, it may be a little deeper for the scope of this conversation but um uh, uh, I believe FHA uh, uh, does require you to uh, have uh, um, some sort of a relationship with the with the buyer. So depending on okay, what kind so of so there could do. be more than uh, one people, in, uh, like one person or two people, and they don't necessarily That's have to be correct. husband and wife. So let's say they don't parents, don't necessarily have to be parents, parents and That's kids correct. can go on the loan. Like two people who are not uh, people who are not related or not, let's say, not married yet, or a brother and sister can go on the loan, correct? Yeah. All day long. All day long. <laughs> hey, Raul. Uh, excellent. So another uh, thing that uh, people are always asking about is that uh, I, I don't have a 700 uh -huh. uh, FICO score, so I can't get a loan. Uh -huh. Is that true or not? 
That's not true. Again, going back to the two main uh, groups of mortgages, FHA is unconventional. FHA goes as low as 580. Conventional goes down to as low as 620. So that is absolutely not true. Now you get a better interest rate with 700 credit score, but the fact of you buying a house, you can absolutely get a home with so, 580 FICO score. Can you go a little bit deeper into the uh, relationships between the person's, like the, the borrower's credit score and the interest rate that they get? Like, is it true that the higher the, higher the credit score, <clears throat> the better the interest rate the person is going to get. Yes. So that's, uh, that's what we call, uh, we call LLPA, loan level price adjustment that mm -hmm. comes from the government. Guffs comes from Fannie Mae. There's a list. You can even Google for LLPA, loan level price adjustment, and it does show you what aspects do have an effect and how much on the interest rate, such as uh, credit score, of course, um, type of property. Condos are more expensive than single family homes. Um, what else Condo would you have hotel. there? Um, Condo hotels are not financed by Fannie or Freddie. That's, you're looking at alternative loan programs. Fannie and Freddie will not do anything that's commercial, income producing. Uh, Excellent. Condo hotels don't would you, do. Uh, would writing. you be sharing that link with us so we could post it uh, after we do oh. the uh, live so we could post it and people could check if they're interested? on seeing and guys here's the thing you can do the homework yourself or you can call the mortgage broker you can call the specialist and uh, run the same questions and probably like the tenth of a time that it will take you to do the research but we're here to give you we're here to give mm -hmm. you resources provide you resources for anything whichever way you want to go if you have questions call david and his team if you you know, like if you want to do the research yourself, you're more than welcome to. David will be sharing the link with us. Um, thank you. I will share this link with you. Um, yes. Next question is, um, if I had a short sale or a bankruptcy, I can qualify for a mortgage for the next seven years. Okay. Okay, uh, it depends on what kind of loan. Uh, so Fannie and Fred, uh, Fannie, Freddie and uh, FHA are different. Now, uh, bankruptcy, uh, the, the conventional loans, which is when you think of conventional, think of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So that's conventional loans, two different agencies. Um, bankruptcy, chapter seven, four years. Chapter 13, two years. FHA, chapter seven, um, two years. So FHA generally is going to be more forgiving uh, with the, with everything, really low credit scores, low interest rates, uh, and also uh, lower time has to have passed from your discharge. We need Would the, you the discharge say that loan. If you know that you had a bankruptcy at any point of your life, it would be useful to collect those bankruptcy documents before you come to see the loan officer or at least the information on the date. I, the bankruptcy documents are so important. Now people, you know, get the bankru bankruptcy discharged and they discard the documents. And, you know, three years later, we're like, we need the discharge letter, oh, we don't have it. Well, then we have to contact the, um, the, the lawyer and, and get a copy from them. I believe there's a portal where you can purchase bankruptcy, a copy of your, but, but hold on to it. It's an important document. Even if it's behind you, I, I recommend holding on to the Excellent. BK documents. Thank <laughs> you. So um, another question on the, um, on the, uh, uh, on the gift funds. Can I, uh, can I use the gift funds uh -huh. towards the down payment? You kind of like touched upon it, but once again, can we go into it yes. once again? Yes. So for both FHA and conventional, this is very, very important. One of my favorite um, leniencies, if you will, in the guideline. Yes, you can. If it is an owner-occupied home, it cannot does not pertain to investment, does not pertain to vacation homes. If it's an owner-occupied home, um, you can absolutely... Uh, apply 100% of the gift funds towards your down payment and closing costs. Excellent. Absolutely. Can the entire down payment be done through the gift funds? Oh, uh, uh, entire down payment towards the Yes, that's true. Excellent. And the closing costs. Um, once again, you just touched upon it, but uh, can you talk to us again? Um, I, 
the question comes is you cannot finance condos. Condos are not financeable. Uh, in some cases. So when a client calls and they're like, David, I want to buy a condo, it gets a bit more complicated. And, and I wish I could avoid talking about it, but we can. So I, I dive into this explanation of why condos are a bit more complicated to finance. Uh, so when you buy a condo, we, you see a condo is a part of a whole. A condo is a part of a whole subdivision of two, 300 units. So Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they look at the whole health of the whole subdivision. It's not just about you, your credit, your income, any of that. They look at the whole thing. And uh, Fannie and Freddie have a term. It's called warrantable. So the condo has to be warrantable for, for us to finance. So this is important. Every time a client mentions, I want to buy a condo, I have to talk about this just to set the right expectations and understanding. Now, once a client goes into contract, we buy a document called condo certs, condo certificate that comes from the HOA. The, uh, it's roughly between 250, 350, and, um, and uh, it's about 45 questions. And uh, then we send it to the bank. To Every bank has an internal condo department. They, they take a look at it and basically give us the determination whether the condo is uh, warrantable and financeable or not. I'll tell you, Alexandra, some of the condos in Las Vegas, they're toxic. You can't touch them. Yeah, you cannot we're, finance them we're, with, uh, we're well aware means. there are some condo complexes that you cannot yeah. finance, period, and they're only sold for cash. On the other hand, there are, uh, there are condo complexes yeah. where you can purchase with VA and FHA loans. They're, uh, they're less common. That's true as well. They're less common, like the most common loan that uh, we use for, uh, for getting the uh, loans. The, like the most common loan that we get for condos is the conventional loan with the Bring down payments, but this will be the most common loan. Now, David, um, another question. We keep on mentioning um, Fa uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Now, let's talk people's language. Who are who are those? <laughs> you know, like so-called Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Yes, who the are agencies. those agencies? We call them because uh, people loans. are like. Okay. I think that this is like a totally different language. Hi, Miguel. So, so yes, hey, Miguel. Uh, so, okay, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, let's talk about that. Um, Fannie Mae uh, is a cute little name for a huge corporation, which if you want to open abbreviation, it's Federal National Mortgage Association. Freddie Mac stands for Federal National Mortgage Corporation. So these are huge agencies that used to be, there wasn't much oversight on them before the meltdown, before 2008. After the two, 2008, they created this government agency, which is called FHFA, uh, Federal Housing Finance Agency. So FHFA is a government agency, is a government body, and, and the head of FHFA is actually appointed by the president. FHFA oversees Fannie and Freddie. Does that make sense? So Fannie and Freddie are agencies that issue guidelines. How will a loan be um, uh, financed? Uh, and it's the guidelines for Fannie are about 1,200 pages. Uh, uh, in, I'd like to think I know them by heart, but uh, basically it is our job as loan officers to know the guidelines and understand what the client has to have to be able to fit in those boxes, those so guidelines, now, and be able to get if you are If your loan is pretty much very common and uh, like fits the box of Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, it means that you can get a conventional FHA mortgage, correct? Conventional loan. No, FHA is not considered a Fannie and Freddie. FHA is a, is a whole separate uh, government agency of its own. It's Federal Federal Housing Administration, which Federal FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, is an office, is a unit under HUD. HUD is, again, a government body, and HUD, the head of HUD is appointed by the president again, and HUD stands for uh, Housing Urban Development. So Housing Urban Development is, again, a, a, a ministry. Of, of sorts it's it's an agency it's a government body and fha yep. is a part so we of have 
with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that are issuing the guidelines and issuing the rules how we're going to get the financing done for the conventional loans. We have HUD that is uh, issuing the rules for the FHA loans. Now, if uh, if my mm-hmm. loan doesn't fit into any of those boxes, does it mean that I cannot get financed or are there other solutions for me? So uh, I know what you're, and I'll answer the question, but besides the FHA and uh, VA, we have, uh, I'm sorry, FHA conventional, we've got the VA, that's Veterans Administration, again, government overseen, and we've got USDA, if you want to buy something outside of the metropolitan Las Vegas area, that would be rural, if you buy something rural, um, that would be um, uh, USDA, and that's United States Department of Agriculture. As you can see, the idea of a mortgage, the low interest mortgage, is of four kinds of mortgages. They're all overseen by the government. Once you step out of this realm of government mortgages, uh, uh, and there's you want to get a government mortgage because rates are low, down payments low. It's just a better product overall. But let's say you're self-employed. Let's say you don't show all your taxes, uh, and you don't you want to buy a house with a uh, you know, the, the, back in 2008, no doc or stated income where, where uh, popular. So those would be non-QM mortgages, non-qualified mortgages, or alternative program mortgages where you can show your bank statements. Uh, one of the programs would be if you're self-employed, instead of showing your taxes, you could show your 12 months of bank statements. Now, these are not government loans. These are smaller uh, lending institutions and that lend out the money. And for taking on the risk of you not showing taxes, you not providing uh, enough documentation, and they're giving an alternative loan, they require usually a higher down payment, slightly higher interest rate. Okay. But yeah. Um, so there's a the whole question about there. the question about income properties or investment properties. Can I use? Yeah. Can okay. I utilize the future perspective earnings from the? Uh, now, from the property that I'm buying towards the uh, towards my income. Ah, okay. Yes, you can. Uh, now, in the case of Fannie Mae, um, you can. Um, this usually comes from the appraiser. If we're buying an investment property or we need the rental income from that unit, we ask the appraiser. The form's called 1007. We basically order a certain form, and the appraiser gives us his opinion of how much rent that house will collect. That's such a cool thing because now you've got uh, you're you're going to basically have an extra source of income because this home will be rented in the future. So the appraiser gives us his opinion. Now we can only use seventy five percent of that income, but that's that's awesome because that's so much income that that the client needs sometimes to qualify. And I also yes. wanted to Very I smart. wanted you to uh, to talk to us about the uh, cases where we are buying the multiple dwellings. So when we're buying something like a duplex, triplex, or fourplex, and you're actually intending, you're not buying uh-huh. it for the investment purposes, but you are extremely lucky that you have additional one, two, three units that you can actually draw income yes. from and pay. So can you, like, let's let's break it down. So, guys, we have single-family residences or condos, which is one unit, but then we have the dwellings that are still one parcel, but they're going to, you can have two units on one parcel, you can have three units, up to four units. And there is no, even if you Correct. live there, and even if you call, like if you buy it with the government loan, like FHA or VA or conventional with the minimum percent down payment, you are actually absolutely um legitimately allowed to able to, to rent the out the rest yes. of the building and to collect rent and uh, to actually use that rent towards your payment so david can you tell us how that works yes so once you go into a contract let's say you're buying a fourplex and you're going to move into one of the units, you're going to occupy one of the units, Uh, the assumption we're going to make, uh, we're hopeful that the other three units are rented. So we basically request the existing tenant leases, lease agreements from the the listing agent, the realtor, and uh, 
that that's wonderful because a lot of times those three other units will cover the whole cost of the mortgage. Again, we have to take 75% of the lease agreement, but that's so awesome. A lot of times you don't need much income to qualify for a fourplex if in fact you're going to move into it and live there. Um, I have my money saved under the mattress. Can I just deposit them right before the close of escrow and use them as down payment? You can if you want to have your loan declined. You absolutely can. Uh, don't do that. Uh, when we meet with a, uh, a client, right, we always try to meet face to face because especially with first time home buyers, there's so much education that needs to happen that we try to sort of cramp into that one hour uh, consultation. Uh, one of the things I tell people is you and I are starting this journey of financing your home. Um, while we're doing this, any financial uh, decisions you make, all I need you to do is send me a quick text message uh, and ask me. And this happens quite often. Uh, if we do set enough uh, expectations and do the job of telling people, uh, you know, don't quit your job, don't buy a house, don't deposit mattress money into your bank account. It's, it's very, very important that the clients are told this in the beginning. Okay, uh, which is, again, I'm going to go back to this recurring theme like a broken record. See a loan officer as soon as you can. The sooner you see a loan officer, the better for you. Uh, at least you'll get that advice. We have a separate email we send out, uh, how home buying do's and don'ts. Sorry, I'm, I'm this It's is okay. We're going answer. to do the whole now, session um, next week. We're going to do the whole session of do's and don'ts for everybody who is interested. Do, yeah, and because don'ts. this okay, is as also like it's a big topic. We'll we'll need half an hour to cover it even more, but we will. I hope that we will cover the majority of it. But right now, like when you just when yeah. you talk about financial decisions, can you can you? Say if you name a few examples, like would uh, would getting a student loan consider be considered a mm -hmm. financial decision? Would getting a new car or putting I don't know, like putting the uh, uh, putting the high balance on one of my credit cards would be considered a financial <laughs> decision? Would going grocery shopping or buying a plane ticket be considered a a financial decision. Give me the examples, please. Great question. So the, I would say the, the most important formula, the only formula that matters in our work in approving mortgages is what's called DTI, debt to income uh, ratio. Your, for you to buy a certain home, uh, qualify for a certain monthly payment, monthly payment is king. So you're, let's say you're qualifying for a $2,000 monthly payment. We're going to see what your total debt to your income, what that ratio is. Uh, it has to be most of the time less than 45%. Okay. Now, a lot of times clients try to calculate their DTI, but, but they, they don't have an understanding of how to properly calculate the income. So I don't suggest anyone doing their own DTI calculations because uh, you may give yourself, uh, allow yourself to have more income than you actually have, than the bank will allow. So, but again, understand that we're going to look at your DTI and the less uh, debts you have, liabilities you have, the more loan you will qualify. So don't buy a car. Don't finance a Cartier watch. Don't do any of those things. Buy a house first, guys. That's more important before you add any more debt, including student loans. Okay. I, I don't, don't care any debt. Don't co-sign for any other loan. Oh, definitely. Uh, guys, not. we will yeah. be talking. That's, that's when you yeah. text me and yeah, I tell we you, will don't be do talking that. about yeah. like the yeah. more more enhanced list of do's and don'ts. The things that will going to yes. the things that are going to positively affect your uh, borrowing power in your uh, mortgage applications, and the things that can uh, negatively affect your application, as well as uh, kill the entire application for you for a while. So we will be we will be talking about those things. Um, another. I will share my do's and don'ts list with you, Alexander. Sorry to interrupt you. So uh, there's a list that we email out to clients. I'll share that with you. So you could probably well, if uh, share it with your you, you know, like viewers. If you don't mind, we'll, we'll share anything that you want to share and anything that yeah. will help our clients to actually better prepare for the mortgage. Yeah. Once again, guys, we're here to respond to your questions. So feel free to, uh, to talk.
type in your questions. We're always, I'm always uh, posting on uh, Instagram saying that, you know, like any question that you want to ask um, um, privately, you can always DM me. You can always DM David. Like we will answer your questions in the live or of course, you know, like we're not discussing any private information of our clients over the, uh, uh, on Instagram, we're not posting it. So anything that is private, we will take it in the private settings over the phone in a uh, personal one-on-one -on -one consultation. And uh, as always, I'm posting our uh, contact information and direct uh, phone numbers so you can always reach out to us. We're here for you. Then we're we're also providing new sources and trying to be helpful anywhere we can. David, um, one more thing. Can you talk to us about the, uh, the news on the interest rates? There has been a lot of excitement. So talk to us. What's going on? So uh, every month on the 12th of every month, um, I, I think I mentioned this before, the CPI index comes out, which is the consumer price index. That's one of the main indexes that shows what the inflation is. And the inflation has been steadily dropping, thank God. And last, <clears throat> you know, on 12th of January, uh, the CPI index came out for the prior month for, for December, and it was six and a half, which was 0.6% less than November. So we have on, we're on this downslope of, of of uh, index dropping. And that triggered news outlets. And, and that did have an effect on the rates, very, very small. And obviously, uh, the, the smallest change in interest rates you know, makes this big ruckus over the, the news. So if rates were roughly about 7.1, 7.2, um, they dropped to, I would say, 6.8 for, for a day or two. And news outlets picked it up and ran with it. And then they went back up to where they were. Um, I really don't anticipate rates dropping within the next several months, but uh, rates are not increasing. And I take that as a huge, huge good news. Rates are not going up. Now you may encounter um, after the 12th of each month, CPI index drops for the next day or two, you, you'll have maybe a 10th of a point or a quarter of a point drop in rates. It always so goes back up. to time locking your rate. You could. You could honestly, you're going to refinance in a year or two. Um, rate right now, I look at rates right now are there are temporary things. So that, that's yeah. I mean, if if I have a loan, we'll definitely ask the client and get their permission and lock. Would advise them to lock uh, on the thirteenth of the fourteenth. Uh, but other than that, uh, it's no big deal. I look at these these rates that they're all temporary. We're going to refinance them all out of that. Um. Um, I need to be, last, last question of today, I need to be in a house in 30 days. It's not enough time to do my loan, to complete my loan. The question okay. is, What's is question? 30 days enough time to, to go through the loan process? So uh, to answer your question today, absolutely. Absolutely. We're closing loans in less than two weeks. We're, we're closing loans before our team is closing loans before I even, you know, do a team meeting and look at what's going on. They're like, we're, we got the final approval. Banks are not busy. Appraisers are not busy. Appraiser is usually the one that takes the longest. But yes, today, absolutely. In the past, we would have to time the contract with the seller. Maybe this is your uh, uh, forte. We would probably do a little bit of a lease back uh, for a week or two. Uh, but in this, in this market, we're, so, it's, it's more than plenty. Uh, I would, I would form it and shape it this way. There is certain process that we have to follow in order to get the loan. So guys, you're not skipping over the steps of submitting your loan application, submitting your docs. Um, you can, there are optional things that you can skip through and uh, we can try to shorten the time if we get the appraisal waiver. And this is something that is less common these days, correct? But it's still happening. And um, there, is a, there is a chance that you can get a appraisal waiver if uh, you're lucky and if it is a good, uh, if it is beneficial for you, correct? More of a benefit than the luck. And then uh, we're still submitting the documents through the underwriting. But what David is saying is that at this point of time, we can, uh, 
we have all of our all of our partners, all of our vendors, including like appraisers, inspectors. They're they're less busy, so we can uh, turn over your documents and go through this process. The process is still the same. We're not skipping steps, but we're going through. We have the ability to go through the process in a faster pace. Thank you for clarifying that. Absolutely, you're right, and. Uh... I appreciate how thorough you are, and sometimes I, I'm not very clear on how I formulate things. So let me let me sort of be clear. When I said we can close a loan, and we usually do close a loan for in two weeks, that's from contract. That's when you go into contract. But there's a month of preparation prior to that. Guys, if you want to close a loan quickly, then you definitely want to get in touch with us, send us your documents, have our team do the work, income calculation, income verification. There's so many steps that are done. We prefer to do those things before you go into contract. That gives us the certainty that your loan will close. So the more work we do prior to you going into contract, the more certain you are your loan will close and will close sooner. So if you've contacted us uh, soon enough and allowed us enough time to work on your loan uh, before you go into contract, then your loan will close and rather And I can sooner. say uh, from the standpoint of a realtor who represents both the sellers and the buyers, there is a magic word that, uh, that actually makes a world of a difference What's that? when I present the offers. It's called underwritten pre-approval. You know, when I receive when uh -huh. I receive uh -huh. offers from the agents whose clients, whose buyers are underwritten pre approved, have the underwritten pre approval, that means to me that these people are serious, they mean to buy, and that means to me that uh, the uh, timeline on that kind of a transaction with that type of a loan is going to be uh, way faster. And I'm going to express my my experience to the seller as the material fact that the person who went through the underwritten pre-approval and before they found the house, these are the people that are serious about buying and that the chances of that loan falling through or not coming to closing are actually less likely than any other loan. So, uh, can you please break down, like, what is the underwritten pre-approval? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, <clears throat> there are two kind of underwriting process. So, let's go with one, the underwriting sort of process. Who is the underwriters? The, like, who? The underwriter is the person at the bank that looks at your package, looks at your documentation, and the, all they do is make sure that your loan fits within the back box of Fannie Mae or FHA or basically conventional. So there's guidelines, as we mentioned, and the underwriter's job is to make sure that your loan fits in those guidelines. That's all they do. Um, they calculate income. They basically verify all the documentation that we submit to them. So what we like to do here is we sort of pre-underwrite your loan. We do get the verification. We do income cal calculation. We do a thorough job. We do what the underwriter's gonna do when you're in contract, make sure there's no risks. If we do see risks, that's when we get in touch with an underwriter. We show them the paperwork, make sure, hey, can you give me an approval on this? Uh, I don't feel very certain about his income, about his assets, about this deposit, whatnot. And uh, that's when we have the certainty that uh, so this loan's going to close in, for sure. Uh, in the world of real estate agents, underwriters are the annoying people who are always asking for more and more documents. <laughs> we try, try to uh, sh kind of shield our agents from the underwriters. That's our job, our headache. And the more work is done prior to the, issuing our pre-approval, and you starting to look for a home, um, the, the, the easier, the, the, the less the underwriter is going to be prone to ask for questions that we're not prepared for. We want to prepare Absolutely. for every kind of outcome. And uh, talking about the time, you know, like the time of the application, is it possible to improve your credit with, while, you're, uh, while you're going through the mortgage application process or obtaining a mortgage? I really don't. 
it's in theory possible you could pay something off on what's called a rescore you could uh, have a rescore done which is basically if you improve pay down for example a liability instead of waiting for that day in a month that your your creditor will report to the bureaus you could pay a certain fee and have that have uh, it's it's 120 bucks to have your uh, the your creditor let's say capital one uh report that immediately to the bureaus and that adjusts your credit score um if you're going to do those things again it's going to fall back to our initial consultation when we meet face to face discuss your credit look at your score and see what interest rate that score is going to give you um i actually here's an interesting story uh, i met with a client they had like 698 credit score i told them i want you to get you 720 and um we got their collection paid off we got their debts paid off and we're working on this and it's taking time I, and, and the idea we want to get them to 720 so they could better better interest rate and my office manager steps in he goes like you do understand they're going to get the same interest rate why are mm -hmm. you putting them through all this does that make sense so uh so we have to, not every time you want to work on the credit, but sometimes if you need that good interest rate, if that's going to work for you, then you and definitely I know you're like, you, you, you never mention about it because guys, David is very humble with, uh, and he doesn't, um, he doesn't uh, promote that much all the tools and all the help that you guys are providing to the clients, but I do the feed, I get the feedback from my clients all the time. And I know that one of the things is that um, sometimes it takes a client like three months, four months, or even six months to get ready for the, uh, uh, for their financing situation to, to be able to qualify. And uh, when this is the case, uh -huh. then, I know you guys have tools and you will actually provide the clients with the roadmap, what they should and should not do, like the same thing, like do's and don'ts to improve their credit. So by the time mm -hmm. when they actually qualify or if there is a certain period that they have to wait out before they, um, before they can qualify, for example, if they had a bankruptcy or a short sale, that we're just waiting for the timing to, uh, to hit that you have the tools and you provide people with the roadmap on how to improve their credit situation. And uh, mm -hmm. go ahead. We, yeah. So we have, we have a, a, a credit simulator, if you will. And a policy we have at the office is if the client has less than 720 credit score, um, we always run the simulator. And a lot of times we do it with them at the conference room so they can look at the results. And if that's something they're willing to do, again, if that helps their, to get them a better rate, uh, a better uh, situation or interest rate, then we're going to print it out and give it to them. All right, guys. So these are the three credit cards. This is how much you should pay down. The simulator will analyze their credit report and tell them what needs to get done to get them to where they want to be, which is over 720. We pay for it. We don't charge our clients. So pretty much if I'm looking for the loan, I can come and do the consultation. And if I'm not ready right away, you guys can uh, help me out to do whatever needs to be done to improve my credits by the time I'm ready. With right. pleasure. And I That's our passion. Now there is something we're else that you that. are always giving to everybody who listens to us in life or who is going to watch their recording we're not at the at the end of the month i'm sure that you guys are already packed and <laughs> super busy but it wouldn't be fair to say you know like to give the gift on the first two sessions and not to not to continue giving it and we're still giving it away like we're giving it away for the next uh till tuesday till the 31st uh, i'm looking at their um uh, calendar. They're, they're fairly busy, but yes, we own a tax preparation firm. I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day operations, but you, I will give you one hour of uh, time to of our tax preparers. So you educate yourself, get a full consultation. This is uh, even more beneficial for self-employed people. I, it's it's just flabbergasting to me to to see how many people don't know the other uh, the difference between Schedule C and S corporation, and because of this they aren't able to buy homes for years. So uh, 
I think proper education can have a huge impact on a person's financial well-being. Uh, and we're giving one hour of free tax education slash consultation and I would until say, the end of the month. As a regular consumer who has no extra time to go through my taxes as much as I can, I don't have the time to do the education and to do my research. I rely on experts. And the best thing that I can uh, I can advise and the best thing that I can do to my clients is actually to introduce them to the experts that are very well versed in both in taxes and mortgages so that um, so that this this information can be combined to the to enhance your benefit to enhance your benefit of getting a mortgage to enhance your benefit That's of cool. getting the mortgage for the amount that you have because sometimes guys we have uh, two different goals because our t our tax goal is to pay uh, less taxes and but it is it goes into the direct correlation with the, how much of a mortgage you're going to qualify for so don't shoot yourself into the foot by filing low tax returns, you know, like and uh, writing it off to the last penny and then get surprised when you go to see the mortgage officer and you think that it's there is a far, um, far distance apart from doing your taxes in February and then getting a mortgage in, um, let's say, September. But guess what? In September, you're going to show the, to the loan there officer the tax return that you just filed, correct, David? That's correct. And a lot of times uh, when we're sitting in across from the tax person and we've got a couple of kids, all we think about is that earned income credit and the short-term gratification and uh, yeah, and then you're out of a house again for another year. And uh, that's true that a lot of so, people right now, every, like, every uh, first quarter of the year, um, I'm sorry, every th first three months of the year, we see the, uh, you know, like we see a lot of clients who are going to come in with their uh, tax refunds and try using them for down payment. Now, David, say it again, please, for the audience. There is nothing wrong with using your, uh, um, the money that you got for the IRS, for what the down it? payment. There is no, yeah, Not at just as good, good as anything else. Money. It's your money. Yes which actually fuels the spring shopping uh, season because I could, I could correlate the spring real estate season opening with the IRS's Absolutely. deposits. Absolutely. So yes, 100%. And um, you won't let me lie. We have people that are coming in with the minimum down payment guys, like even the FHA loans that, when all you need is your three and a half percent down and we get the rest covered by the uh, seller and we get the uh, we get to buy, buy down the interest rate if we have additional funds so sometimes that check that you get from the IRS will get you into the house for many years to come the message I want to leave our your viewers today, our viewers, is own something, guys. Own something as soon as possible. Um, don't wait to, uh, at least I don't recommend waiting till you um, save up enough money to buy the, your dream home. The dream home is something you graduate into. I have never seen someone unorganically just go buy a million dollar home or five million. It just doesn't happen. You need to start below. You need to start somewhere. You're not going to love that house, but you're going to graduate into that. That house has to appreciate in value. Take that. It snowballs, really. If you take the equity, graduate into house number two, three. The decent house you're going to love is probably house number four. But it's it's so hard to go get a six or seven hundred thousand dollar house if you've never owned a, owned a home mortgage before a house before. So own something, own something sooner. And then the sooner you own the house that you don't like, then the sooner you'll graduate into the house that you do like. And uh, talk to the loan officer as soon as possible. Make sure you your taxes are strong. Make sure you're educated. I, it's it's just, you know Alexandra. I spend at least two hours a day face-to-face -face with clients, mostly uh, Schedule C self-employed people that have no idea about S-corporations, no idea how to, how to um, do proper taxes and make income affordable where they can actually purchase something. 
and to own the biggest asset of their life. And people go through their life just well, renting. Well, I mean, we all need tenants, but I, I suggest people I want, buy houses. I cannot agree with you more because, you know, like, first of all, as, <laughs> as a person with two master's degrees, I can tell you guys, I went to two wonderful universities, got a wonderful education, but never once, never once, I even seen an option of getting, you know, like getting educated on mortgage, getting educated on my taxes. Taxes are more common, but who likes that boring class? You know, like in people, we, we don't even understand. Once again, I never seen the class on how to treat your credit, how to, how to manage your credit, how to manage your credit score. The, these are the three things that are going to make a substantial difference in your life, correct? And they're going to influence your well, well-being. It can, uh, you know, like it can create a generational wealth for your family. If you, if you do it right, these Absolutely. are, these is the knowledge that, and you might not have the time or think that you have the time, but I think that you, you might consider putting a high priority on learning about those things or at a minimum consulting with the expert that can tell you how important it is and that can tell you the magic that the knowledge, even like, even the, you know, like you don't have to be an expert, but the little knowledge about those things and how to how to work in this system will help you to generate wealth, to save money, and to actually to actually create something that is going to go beyond you and take you way closer to your dream. Because we all dream of winning a Powerball lottery, but what are the chances of those? Like how many people? make their living or make their fortune by working hard and how many people are making their fortune by winning a Powerball. So you can take it either way. So that just gave, that just gave me an idea. I think we should do a separate session on wealth creation and the things that I've learned in, in real estate investment. And that's what really gets my juices flowing. That's, that's, that's what really gets me excited is uh, when I talk about how to create wealth with real estate and the things that I've learned in the last 17 years that I've been doing mortgages, I, I suggest you and I do a separate uh, um, a session on this, uh, on wealth creation, and uh, I'll prepare for Not, it. And I think you're 100%. Like it. I love it. I learn from you there, every time we talk. <laughs> so I will, you know, even if our audience says that uh, we don't want this session, I want it for the selfish reasons. I'll take it. <laughs> They'll like it. Trust me. There's, I see this invisible light bulb go off once you talk about certain things. So those it's not with, intuitive knowledge. So those who are thinking. I think it'll, uh, it will help some people. Sorry. Yeah, so it'll help some for those who are thinking that uh, you need to have a million dollars uh, in your bank account to start investing in real estate. Is that how it works? That's exactly the opposite. And, we'll and this, is, this is important. But you can make a million dollars fairly quickly. You can make a million Absolutely. dollars fairly quickly. You don't need to, you don't need to start from but, a million. Uh, we'll correct? talk about that. God, no. Usually start with 20,000. From 20,000 to a million. That's so, how I'm going to announce that, that session. <laughs> okay. so, David, thank okay. you so much. We've been, uh, we've been going on for an hour, almost an hour again. But I know I'm yes. getting a lot of uh, positive feedback from what we do. So if it helps, if it helps one person, if it helps, you know, like two people, guys, we're here for you. That's, that's the purpose. That's all we want. We're here because we're passionate about what we're doing. And we want you to, you know, like we want you to get this useful information without pulling your credit. <laughs> thank, yeah. thank you, David. Great talking to everyone. Yes. You too, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.